Good morning, nice to see you all. I hope you're staying safe and well. Welcome back to part 7 of our series of video tutorials on Jekyll and Hyde, chapter 10. In today's lesson we're looking at another key passage. I've called it the battle between Jekyll and Hyde, but really it's the battle for Jekyll's soul that's taking place in his descriptions. He's describing how he uh, eventually loses the core ability to transform voluntarily uh, from Jekyll into Hyde and back again. And as the struggle between Jekyll and Hyde worsens, we see that actually it becomes a battle really between good and evil that takes place within Henry Jekyll. And that evil in the form of Hyde uh, overcomes and triumphs eventually. So this passage is about, is, is Jekyll looking back, describing the process of re of realization, really, of, of realizing that he's slowly losing hold of his better nature, his better self, uh, and becoming uh, the worse self. Uh, so we'll look at this passage. Uh, we'll do a close reading. I'm just going to remind you of the summary of chapter 10 before we start, so you won't hear my voice again for 30 seconds or so. Once you once I'm back, I'll read to you the key passage, and we'll have a close reading. See you shortly. Okay, I'm going to start from the top, from small indeed was my appetite. Small indeed was my appetite. This inexplicable incident, this reversal of my previous experience, seemed like the Babylonian finger on the wall to be spelling out the letters of my judgment, and I began to reflect more seriously than ever before on the issues and possibilities of my doubled existence. That part of me which I had the power of projecting had lately been much exercised and nourished. It seemed to me as though, of late as though the body of Edward Hyde had grown in stature, as though when I wore that form, I were conscious of a more generous tide of blood, and I began to spy in danger that, if this were much prolonged, the balance of my nature might be permanently overthrown, the power of voluntary change be forfeited, and the character of Edward Hyde become irrevocably mine. The power of the drug had not been always equally displayed. Once very early in my career, it totally failed me. Since then, I had been obliged on more than one occasion to double, and once with infinite risk of death, to treble the amount. And these rare uncertainties had cast hitherto the sole shadow of my, on my contentment. Now, however, and in light of that morning's incidents, uh, accident, rather, I was led to remark that whereas in the beginning the difficulty had been to throw off the body of Jekyll, it had of late gradually but decidedly transferred itself to the other side, all things, therefore, seemed to point to this, that I was slowly losing hold of my original and better self and slowly becoming incorporated with my second and worse. Between these two, I now felt I had, no, I had to choose. My two natures had memory in common, but all other faculties were most unequally shared between them. Jekyll, who was composite, now with the most sensitive apprehensions, now with a greedy gusto, projected and shared in the pleasures and adventures of Hyde. But Hyde was indifferent to Jekyll, or but remembered him as the mountain bandit remembers the cavern in which he conceals himself from pursuit. Jekyll had more than a father's interest. Hyde had more than a son's indifference. To cast in my lot with Jekyll was to die to those appetites which had long secretly indulged and had of late begun to pump, pamper. To cast it in with Hyde was to die to a thousand interests and aspirations and to become, as a blow and forever, despised and friendless. The bargain might appear unequal, but there was still another consideration in the scales, for while Jekyll would suffer smartingly in the fires of abstinence, Hyde would not be, even be conscious of all that he had lost. Strange as my circumstances were, the terms of this debate are as old and commonplace as man. Much the same inducements and alarms cast the die for any tempted and trembling sinner, and it fell out with me as it falls out with so vast a majority of my fellows that I chose the better part and was found wanting in the strength to keep it. So this is a challenging passage, but it's absolutely fascinating if we start to break it down and look at some of the ideas that Stevenson is writing about in regards to the relationship between Jekyll and Hyde, and essentially the battle between good and evil that is raging within Jekyll. Um, it's a fascinating passage because we get an insight into 
the psychology of the transformation into, into what actually takes place into uh, between the two characters in terms of who experiences what when one is the other. So what does Jekyll experience when he's transformed into Hyde? What does Hyde experience when, he, when Jekyll is transformed back into his usual respectable self? So we get this really interesting insight into that as well. Let's start at the top. And we remember that the last lesson we focused on the hand, the two hands rather, the hand that was lean and corded, which is Hyde's hand, and the strong, large hand of Jekyll. And he wakes up with you know, with seeing himself transformed into Hyde overnight. And we talked about how this marks a shift in the dynamic between the two. This marks a moment, a, a crucial moment, a crucial turning point for Jekyll as a character because he has lost the ability, or, or rather he is losing the ability to voluntarily transform uh, from one character to the other. So he's, he's lost the ability to transform uh, voluntarily, which is obviously incredibly dangerous for him and, and his reputation, but also... Uh, it's dangerous because of what's t what's taken place in the novel, and we know that Hyde is a known criminal. He's a, he's a feared uh, gothic monster. So obviously, if Jekyll were caught transforming in public or uh, caught uh, as the wrong character and, and and transforming into the wrong character, he would be in, in grave danger, and his reputation would be tarnished. He would be disgraced, uh, and he would have horrified uh, the Victorian society by his brazen breach of natural laws in conducting the experiment in the first place. I want to start at the top um, and I want to start with that illusion here and I'll just mark it on the page before, it, before I explain it to you. Uh, so we have a reference to another story, to, to a biblical passage, a biblical uh, tale uh, which I'll briefly explain to you because it's an important moment when he explains, uh, Jekyll says, like the Babylonian finger, uh, so it's a simile here, like the Babylonian finger uh, on the wall uh, to be spelling out the letters of my judgment. Let's get a picture of that up to help explain the illusion. So here we have an artistic interpretation by the great painter Rubens of, this, of the illusion that I'm about to explain to you. In the painting here, you have uh, some words in Hebrew being written, at, they're supposed to be in the sky, but it looks like it's on the wall. Um, but they, they, these are Hebrew words um, that are being written by God. Um, and he's warning he's warning the king who's the subject of the painting and you can see the king who's turned and has that horrified expression as he reads the writing um he's warning the king that his empire will be will soon fall and that he'll soon be slain the king in the painting is known as king belshazzar uh he's the king of the neo-babylonian empire and essentially the the the, the, the god, god is warning king belshazzar that his because of the evil that he's allowed to dwell in his palace uh, his empire will be destroyed and he'll be slain. Um, and the, this is from the book of Daniel, because Daniel is summoned to, to interpret what, what, what the words say. Um, so if we think about this and why Jekyll refers to this, we actually get the very famous idiom, you know, the writing on the wall, which I'm sure you've heard before. You know, if, you, if someone says the writing's on the wall, it's like a bad omen. It's the idea that something clearly unpleasant is going to happen, something te terrible will happen in the future. So when Jekyll uses this illusion, he says that, you know, that uh, this instant when he wakes up uh, and, he, and he's transformed into Hyde, this is his Babylonian finger on the wall moment. So that's, what, that's why it's so significant. It's the moment where he realises that the writing is on the wall for him, metaphorically, in that he will soon no longer be able to, you know, to... Uh, transform voluntarily and he's doomed in a sense just like king belshazzar is so in the in this simile he's comparing himself to king belshazzar who sees these who sees the writing appear on the wall and knows that he is doomed knows that his empire is going to fall and similarly uh, jekyll is aware that he too is doomed he too is likely to lose his better side he's likely to lose his better nature uh, as as the evil overwhelms him so that's the explanation of that illusion and Stevenson makes it absolutely clear that this illusion is meant to serve uh, to represent Jekyll's destiny in the sense, because he says it spells out the letter of my judgment. Uh, so Je he know Jekyll knows that he himself will be judged and, uh, and found wanting. He will be damned and punished for his actions uh, in this story. I'd now like to discuss the shift and the change in dynamic that has taken place between Jekyll and Hyde. And Jekyll talks about how uh, this the part of him that had 
have the power of projecting, so that's hide. That's the part of him here, the power of projecting. That kind of means he has the power of unleashing, the, the power of releasing. And he's released Tide. He says it's been much exercised and nourished. And we talked in an, uh, an earlier lesson, uh, I drew you two stick men. I said, well, this is, I did have a top hat for Jekyll. Here's Jekyll, here's Hyde. And we, we speculated about why Jekyll is tall, why Hyde is small. We talked about repression in a previous lesson. Well, now it's interesting that uh, Stevenson writes, the body of Edward Hyde had grown in stature. So Hyde has grown, he's gotten taller, he, he is starting to get bigger uh, and he's gr growing, which is interesting, it's like, and it's quite sinister this idea of the evil within Jekyll growing uh, and developing. And Jekyll specula speculates about why that might be and he thinks it's because he's allowed Hyde out, he's released him, he's given him more freedom, he's given him more exercise and more nourishment. And it's, I find it fascinating choices of verbs here uh, because they sound kind of maternal and they have this, uh, and we'll, we'll talk about maternalism and paternalism, the idea of the parent-like relationship between Jekyll and Hyde later in the passage. But to me, the idea that Jekyll has nourished Hyde, he's exercised him, it, it's as though Hyde is a pet, although he's, uh, as though he's a kind of infant that Jekyll has raised and he's growing and he's developing. And obviously, the fact that he's growing is, is incredibly sinister and it's a, it's a foreboding sign because, of course, uh, it means that sooner or later he will outgrow Jekyll and, and perhaps topple him. And that's what Jekyll speculates on next. He says um, he spies a danger that if this was to go, to go on, the balance of my nature might be permanently overthrown, the power of a voluntary change to be forfeited and the character of Edward Hyde to be irrevocably mine. And it's the use of adverbs initially that really kind of emphasise the danger and the perilous situation that Jekyll is in. Firstly, he says, um, the balance of my nature might be permanently overthrown. That, that adverb permanent, you know, that emphasises the danger, the, the, the proximity that he is to, to real trouble. Uh, he talks about the balance of the nature. Here's, here's our scale his Jekyll, his Hyde, and at the moment there's a power shift and soon perhaps it will go the other way, soon Hyde will be more powerful than Jekyll and he's worried that the balance metaphorically of his being will be overthrown permanently. And that's quite an interesting choice of word as well, that verb overthrow. You, you usually associate that with you know the overthrow of an empire, the overthrow of a king. Um, and here it's really the overthrow, you know, the overthrow of the creator by the created. Um, it reminds you a little bit of Frankenstein and how, you know, throughout Frankenstein, the created, which is the, the monster, is trying to revenge the, uh, and take, take vengeance on his creator. And here the dynamic shifts because the creator uh, is now in, in, in peril and his creation, this monster, is taking vengeance on him. It, it gives you this, in, it, there's, a, there's another aspect to this, really, which is an, which is an Oedipal relationship between the two. Um, Oedipus was, and I'll show you an image, I think I've talked about him before, but I'll, I'll go over it very quickly now. Oedipus, what it, it hit on your screen here, is a figure from Greek myth. He is the king of Thebes. Uh, and we all know the story, we know probably the Freudian uh, Oedipus complex, a very famous theory that Freud devised. Um, based on the play by Sophocles. And essentially, Oedipus is the king of Thebes who accidentally kills his own father and finds out about it years later that he's married, he's not only killed his own father, he's also married his own mother. And we know that Freud uses this as a kind of theory of uh, child development, the, the idea that all, all males, all boys, uh, have a subconscious desire to castrate and kill their own fathers and marry their own mothers. Um, and there's an Oedipal, I think, an Oedipal relation between Hyde and Jekyll, I think, in this sense, uh, the Oedipal figure would be Hyde uh, and the father figure would be Laertes in the myth, which is Jekyll. I think that there's a definite dynamic that's Oedipal, I think, between the two. Whether or not Stevenson did that intentionally, I'm not sure. So we talk, he's, he's, I think it's an interesting, we talked about the, the danger that Jekyll is in, the idea that he's, he may well be overthrown, um, 
the power of voluntary change might be forfeited, forfeited to give up something. So the idea of being able to change voluntarily, he might have to give up. And that's obviously incredibly dangerous. And, it, and again, if he can't transform voluntarily, it suggests that Hyde is growing ever more powerful. And the kind of worse, I suppose the, the final clause of the sentence is the most ominous. He says, the character of Hyde become irrevocably mine. So the idea that, you know, if something's irrevocable, it can't be undone. And he may well become Hyde permanently. That's the danger that he is facing. So this is all about the balance in his nature. It's all about the fact that there is a great b battle, an, an internal battle raging between the good and the evil. And the evil is at the moment overcoming that. Jekyll speculates further on this when he says later in the passage, I was slowly losing hold of my original and better self and becoming slowly incorporated with my second and worse. Um, and again, he's speaking kind of metaphorically here, but again, it's this idea that he's gradually losing who, losing his identity. And it's interesting, his choice of words here, when he says, my original self, uh, obviously he's talking about who he is, he's talking about uh, the respected doctor, he's talking about his um, dignified position in society, but I also think there's a reference here to Adam and Eve and the, you know, the original man, the first man. Um, it's his better self. And these adjectives are, are interesting because they, they start to convey the regret that Jekyll is experiencing. He's regretting performing this terrible experiment. He's starting to realise uh, the severity of the situation that he's in and, the consequent, and, and, and how severe the consequences will be and the punishment. And then this is, again, this, the final clause of the sentence has this kind of ominous feel to it, an ominous tone. He's becoming slowly incorporated uh, with my second and worse. And that, work, that idea of b being slowly, gradually transformed, uh, that's, that's what he means by the, with, with incorporated, being brought into. And it's interesting how you know, he, the word incorporated in, contains the word corporal, which means kind of the idea of having a body. So he's losing his original body and, and having a new and taking up the form of a new body uh, which is second and worse and the use of juxtaposition here uh, makes clear the contrast uh, Je Jekyll is the original Hyde is the second Jekyll is the better Hyde is the worse and it's again really emphasizing the dual nature here uh, of Jekyll and uh, the stark contrast between his two natures Okay, we've come to our first checkpoint. Please read the instructions carefully. Uh, if you need more time, feel free to take it. Uh, I'd also recommend rewinding and rewatching certain sections of the video in, if you are stuck. Uh, and please now pause the video. I'll see you shortly. Welcome back. We now have a fascinating description of what's taking place in Jekyll's psyche. And by psyche, I mean his mind. His, his, and, and we get a fascinating portrait of his psychology here, it, especially in regards to what takes place and what, uh, what, when, when Jekyll is Hyde and also what characteristics the two share. Uh, it's fascinating. He says, firstly, my two natures had memory in common, but other faculties were most unequally shared between them. So we get an idea that this is not a simple case of 50-50. It's not the case that, let's just draw our duality diagram again, it's not the case that it's sim Jekyll is simply 50% Jekyll, 50% Hyde. Um, they have an unequal distribution, and, and it's, it's ambiguous as to who has the largest share of what, but he'll, he'll go on to that in a second. Uh, and other faculties means other processes, other parts, other uh, parts of the mind. So, firstly, memory they have in common. So that's interesting because that uh, makes Jekyll compl very, very complicit. And by complicit, I mean kind of uh, guilty in a sense uh, by association. 
because he's clearly aware through memory of what Hyde has done. What He's aware of the crimes that Hyde has committed and he stayed silent about them. Um, and there's this interesting kind of voyeurism. And I'll spell that for you here. If you're a voyeur, you're someone, you're basically a peeping Tom. And there's a, there's a voyeurism here. As Jekyll seems to only be able to share in the memory of Hyde, but he gets great pleasure from watching Hyde, from um, replaying these memories. So he's, it's as if he's watching Hyde doing things that are completely forbidden for him as a respectable Victorian gentleman, and yet getting great satisfaction and great pleasure out of it. He says, uh, Jekyll, who is composite, now with the most sensitive apparitions, with greedy gusto, projected and shared in the pleasures and adventures of Hyde. So Jekyll is just as guilty, just as diabolical as Hyde is. They both project, they both share in the pleasures, which remain very ambiguous. And essentially, Jekyll, uh, not Jekyll, Stevenson's using euphemism again. Uh, I'll put a question mark to represent the idea of ambiguity. What pleasures is he, uh, is he referring to? So it's fascinating that there's a kind of animal nature to Jekyll as well, because we've talked about Hyde and animalistic imagery related to his character. But here there's this idea of Jekyll himself being greedy, uh, being uh, kind of insatiable, having an appetite that can't be satisfied when it comes to sharing in the pleasures and adventures of Hyde. Um, and of course, these pleasures and adventures are crimes. They're, they're, they're examples of vice, of sin. And the way that Jekyll you know, tries to distance himself from the terrible crimes that Hyde is committing is through language. He's not saying exactly what Hyde is doing. He's not giving it a name. He's, in fact, he, he is giving a name, but he's giving names that are not accurate. So we have this idea that Jekyll is clearly someone who takes pleasure in, in what Hyde has been doing. We then get a fascinating insight into what Hyde thinks of Jekyll. And the, the, the metaphorical figurative language that Stevenson uses is, is really, really interesting. He says Hyde was indifferent to Jekyll. Um, and that word is really interesting. That adjective is really interesting. It suggests that he doesn't really care for him. He doesn't have any, any particular feelings of gratitude to Jekyll. Remember that Hyde is the, is the thing that was created by the creator Jekyll. He doesn't seem to be grateful for, for being given life, for being given freedom by Jekyll. He, he doesn't really seem to have any particular strong feelings towards Jekyll. Perhaps that's not surprising given we were told that everything about Hyde centers on the self. Go back to a few lessons back, we were told that he is literally uh, completely and utterly selfish and only concerned with gratifying his own pleasures. We then have this interesting metaphor here, uh, which kind of further emphasizes the, I'll put M for metaphor, further emphasizes the relationship between the two and how odd it is. He says, Hyde remembers Jekyll as the mountain bandit re remembers the cavern. Okay, so let's just draw our, here's our cavern. Here's our mountain bandit coming back. Uh, I'll give him a kind of hat, a mountain bandit hat. And he's, he's retreating, he's going into the cave. Here's our mountain. So, fascinating metaphor here. In the metaphor, which I've just drawn out for you, or doodled for you here, Jekyll becomes a mere cavern, a, a cavern, a hiding place, for Hyde the Mountain, I'll put J and H, for Hyde the Mountain Bounder. So Jekyll, ha, so really what's interesting here is that Hyde has no, like a, it kind of reiterates this idea that Hyde really doesn't have any particularly strong feelings for Jekyll. There's not a strong bond between the two. There's not this kind of father-son bond that you might expect from the creator and the created. Rather, essentially Jekyll is a place of convenience for him. Jekyll is a place where he can shelter. Uh, and frankly, and maybe that's the reason his name is Hyde. And remember that the name Mr. Hyde is a pun. Frankly, Jekyll is a hiding place for Mr. Hyde. Pardon the pun, but that's what he is to him. He's merely a, it goes back to this idea, which we've talked about in previous lessons, of Jekyll being a facade, you know, a mask. And how Jek Jekyll used to brag about how he, he could use his own, respectability, his own position in society, his status as a Victorian gentleman uh, as a mask to hide his inner evil. But really the irony is here 
that Je that's exactly how Hyde sees Jekyll. He's, he only sees Jekyll as a hiding place. He has no strong attachment, no strong bond to him. So really interesting there. Then we have this um, Oedipal father-son uh, description here. Jekyll had more than a father's interest. Uh, Hyde had more than a son's indifference. So this idea that there's a binary between the two, Jekyll being the father, uh, Hyde being the son, but it's not, it's not a strong relationship between the two. It's not a loving relationship. It's one in which the father seems to take a lot of interest in the son, but it's not reciprocated. It's not, it's not mutual. Uh, Hyde has no interest in his father. He seems, to be, um, he seems to have no strong attachment to him. So I suppose that might be the, the theme here of the text that Jekyll is, has a strong attachment to Hyde, seems to take pleasure in his ad adventures, as he puts it, but Hyde has no strong attachment to Jekyll. Really interesting passage. Let's take a checkpoint. Okay, we've reached another checkpoint. Please follow the instructions very carefully. Remember to rewind and rewatch certain sections of the video if you're stuck, and I'll see you shortly. Please now pause the video. Welcome back. In the final section of the passage, uh, really I just want to talk about how Jekyll makes a decision, a very crucial decision, that is to try and suffer smartingly in the fires of abstinence. It's a very powerful metaphor. And what he means by the fires of abstinence, uh, let's start with the word abstinence. That means if you abstain, you give something up. So if you're abstinent, if, if in this sense, he's, he's trying to give up transforming into Hyde. But you can abstain for lots of things in life. So you might you might abstain from drugs or alcohol, for example. So it's an interesting metaphor that Jekyll decides to suffer smartingly in the fires of abstinence, because abstinence, you know, you, you usually associate with a cleansing and a purging, and that's why the fire is a powerful image. Fires cleanse and they purge. But also you have to think about the significance of hell and how, for Jekyll, giving up this ability to transform and, and, and to give license and freedom to his inner, inner evil will be hell-like. It will be like a punishment, like a purgatorial uh, purging. So it's an interesting metaphor uh, in some senses. And what I find interesting is how Jekyll compares himself to all sinners. That's basically what he says. So he says, uh, I am like any trem tempted or trembling sinner. Um, and he says the debate here is as old and commonplace as man. And what he means here, he is talking about a debate that is uh, as old and commonplace as man. He's talking about morality about right and wrong he's talking about good and evil and how all man all men in some senses you know wrestle between good and evil all human beings struggle to make the right decision to do the right thing and he's i suppose no he's supposed i suppose he's trying to maybe create sympathy for himself but he's saying look i'm like any other person who has sinned and who or who's been tempted uh, so therefore you know I, i'm like in a sense like jesus in the desert I'm like Adam and Eve, I, I've, ha I've had to experience sin, I've experienced temptation. And despite his decision to choose what he calls the better part, and that means you know, choosing not to transform into to Hyde, to choosing to be Jekyll, he says ominously at the end of the section he was found wanting. So we know that he is destined, in a sense, to be tempted again and destined to sin again and to fall again. So despite making this decision to suffer in the metaphorical uh, fires of abstinence, we know that Jekyll is destined to be tempted once again to transform into Hyde and to fall into that, uh, and to, to commit that sin and to fall. Um, but it's a fascinating passage. I hope, you, I, hope it's, I hope my explanations have helped to break down the importance of this passage. So that brings us to a close uh, in this lesson. This is the end of part seven. Uh, in next lesson, we'll be looking at another key scene from chapter 8.
and, and that will be uh, from chapter 10 sorry and that will be part eight of our series thanks for watching see you next time